Uh, first lesson is it's Git. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's the very first thing. That's the first thing you need. Is it Git? Oh, okay. Uh, what's that? Um, no, I think I just got it closer, or uh, turn the volume up in the back. I'll put that down. I'll just adjust this a little bit. Okay. Had plenty of time to adjust this before I started, but no, I'm going to do it right now. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, as I was introduced, I'm Dwayne. Um, I work at a company called Pantheon. I'll get back to that in a second. I make things. Um, I like reading comics and web comics, and I love karaoke. Didn't find any karaoke last night, but that's all right. I'm sure somebody did. And karaoke happened in the city, and that makes everything cool. Uh, the slides for this and everything else I do is out on mcdwayne.com. I would recommend going there and following along in the slides if you have a laptop or other machine in front of you. Uh, there are slides that I won't be showing today that have animated GIFs that show exactly what all of these commands look like when you actually run them. So if you get lost, you can go back and see it as a tutorial and play along at home. That's the intention. One of my favorite talks of, or books I've ever read in my life is uh, you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. And it's true, I can't teach you Git today. I can teach you the fundamentals and you can walk out with a better understanding, but until you actually put the stuff in motion, yeah, you're never gonna learn it. So go to get the slides and I'll give you a jumping off point as a template to get going or take many of the many, many, many online classes for Git. Anyway, uh, quick plug for Pantheon. I work for a company called Pantheon. We are a platform as a service for running your Drupal and WordPress websites. Hosting is definitely one of the feats we accomplish, but scale is our whole game. If you need scale for your team or for your sites, if you're doing a lot of things, talk to us. We can make your life a lot better. But I want to know who's in the room. Who am I talking to? Like, there's more people here than I thought would be on a Sunday morning. So thank you very much for coming back to WordCamp Asheville 2019. Um, so who here is a designer? Awesome. Who here is a developer? Awesome. A lot of the same, a lot of the same hands. Uh, and anybody a project manager in here? Cool. I think it's actually super practical for, for everybody. Uh, who here is a content creator, content editor, con maker? Yes, I use Git for all of my content storage needs. And it makes my life really simple as a writer because I can go back and see all of the things I've written and why I wrote them that way. But I'll talk about that later. Uh, I know we started a little bit late, but I still want to take like a minute. And we're at WordCamp, and WordCamp's real, the real value here is talking to other people. Like the sessions are valuable, don't get me wrong, and that's part of why we're here. But really, if you haven't connected with all the other people at WordCamp, uh, we should do that. So just take a second, look around, see somebody you don't know, and just go introduce yourself real quick, just like a minute tops. Nice to meet you. I'm Dwayne. Where are you in from? Um, Horsetown. Horsetown? Oh, okay. Wow. Everybody drives in for this. Yeah. Everybody comes in just for this. Well, this is a special camp, I think. Yeah. All right. Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. All right. That sounds about good enough. But thank you for indulging me. We can find our seats again, and we'll. Uh, you can you can you can find that person later and have a full blown conversation with them. Uh, but for the sake of WordPress TV and the folks at home, I'm going to move on. So if I could get us back, everybody, I've lost the crowd. <laughs> this happens sometimes. All right, everybody, let's get going with Git. <laughs> All right, so why are we talking about Git today? Why did you come in the room and talk about Git? Like, what the heck are we even talking? Why are we talking about this thing? If you don't understand the why, the what doesn't make any sense. Um, this, this happens to everybody eventually, where you've renamed a doc a thousand times and you don't know which final, final, final is the right final. This is the old fashioned way of doing version control in documents. And then we have the Dropbox method. Uh, who, wins, who wins here? They both edited the same document and they both uploaded them. And those are the timestamps. Blue, blue wins, that's correct. That's a problem. Because what happens if yellows work? And we've all been here. Uh, this is a white screen of death because we edited something we shouldn't have. And we pushed something around and like, oh, well, that, that doesn't work at all, does it? Who here has ever used the in admin editor for anything? Yeah, 
We all have eventually popped it open. It's like, I just got to put this little thing in there. I just got to do this one little thing. And then it becomes this. And then we got to figure out what the heck we even did. And ultimately, like, I use Command Z almost every time I touch my keyboard because I can't type that well. But this is a terrible strategy for, like, managing documents. It's a good for tactical solution for when you're just typing in a text doc. But it's a bad solution overall for getting back in time. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Git, the version control system. If you go to Wikipedia, it says something like this. It's completely, completely accurate, but it's a bunch of gobbledygook because you don't know what it means. And the manual for Git, if you type man git into any terminal, this is probably what it's going to tell you. It's the stupid content trackers. <laughs> Notice it's not the stupid code trackers. It's not a stupid you know, developer tool. It's a content tool. Ultimately, that's what Git is. So it applies to anything that's in a text doc. But we'll get back to that. I always think it's important to see where this stuff came from and the faces of the people who wrote it. So we probably should all know this guy. Uh, if you use Linux at all, or use anything that uses Linux, like everyone in the world does, uh, we can thank Linus Torvald. And in 2005, he said, uh, the best decision I have made in my entire career is putting Junio in charge of the project, of Git. And this guy, to this day, maintains the Git repository on GitHub, or all the other Git repositories. This is the master key holder for Git. Really funny guy. If you go like read his pull requests, they're actually very entertaining. And what they had the problem with, and why they worked together to make Git, it wasn't just some idea they cooked up. They were building Linux, literally inventing it, and said, there's over 1,000 people around the world who need some way to access this code and communicate with each other about how we are interacting and building this code. And they borrowed the old IBM term knowledge worker, which I think IBM coined in the 70s, or the 60s, I think. It's the earliest record I can find of a knowledge worker in, that, in this context. It said, knowledge workers do things. They modify objects over time. So what we're really talking about is a knowledge worker creating a document, saving a document, editing that document, saving it again, and keeping track of every time they've modified that document, including an explanation of what they did so that you in the future know exactly what you did. More importantly, other people in the project, without having to dig through lines of code, can quickly summarize, what have we done here? Why, why did we do that thing? But really, we're not talking about single text docs. If we were only talking about single text docs at a time, Git probably wouldn't exist. But who's ever looked at the internals of their operating system? Like, just cracked it open, and we're curious, and like, just started digging through files. It's fun. Your machines are yours. Like, the, the, part of the beauty of open source, and that's why I embrace Linux. Uh, I use uh, Mac for work stuff, but I embrace Linux the rest of my life because it's ours. Like, literally, it's our code. We can go do anything we want with it. And looking through it is uh, kind of a fun thing to do. And there's so many files. There are so many files. And what do they do? And it's not just... Linux, uh, WordPress. There's so many files in WordPress. So we're talking about whole projects at a time, giant sweeping changes and folder after folder after folder. And we create these projects, we save them, we edit them, and we save them again. And that's why Git came into existence. And if you understand this picture, then you probably get everything I'm going to talk about today. And you probably don't need to be here unless you just want to talk about commands themselves. And I more want to leave you with the impression that this is how Git works than individual commands in your fingertips as you leave the room today. And this, yes, it might sound a little funny, but here is an actual, actual chart for Git. Git is graphical based. It's node based. There's these concepts of these balls on a timeline. And once you wrap your head around that notion, and it might not make any sense to you right now, but when you start using it, like, wow, that's how my Git history works. That is this crazy chain and branching and alternate timelines and going back in time. In all reality, these look a lot alike. So, very important to all of this, and it feels like a weird segue, but you got to remember, everything with Git is local. It's a stupid content tracker knows other versions of itself can exist, but it thinks it's the only one and thinks it's the most important one in the entire world, wherever it is. 
a Git instance on your machine and a Git instance on a computer you don't own called GitHub or Bitbucket or on another machine somewhere else in the world, from its point of view, it thinks it's local and it's the only one that really matters. Kind of important thing to remember, and it took me a while to wrap my head around that one. But again, fundamental concept, it's important. It's also super lightweight. If you change uh, a 10 meg file, change two characters in it, and you SFTP that across the wire, how many megs do you have to move when you edit that file? 10 megs, that's correct. Uh, if you change two characters and move that same file changes over Git, how many characters do you have to move? Two characters and a little bit of metadata around it. So not even close to what you'd have to move otherwise. Super lightweight. Git is not a backup tool. It kind of is for your code. It can double as a backup system for your code. It's not intended to be. Uh, but I s put this in here specifically to remind people because a lot of people when they hear about this like, oh, that's awesome. I got everything backed up. I don't have to worry about backups anymore. Uh, we're not talking about your database. We're not talking about your media files. We are talking about your code when we talk about Git in context of WordPress. But Git is a nice backup tool if all you do is text files. But we'll come back to that later. But it's not intended to be a backup tool. That's a side effect. And if you can point me to a better documented thing that exists in relation to our space, please tell me, because I can't find one. There are more documents, blogs, tutorials, guides, everything written about Git than there are any other project I've ever seen in my life. It's this important. I think we should honestly be teaching it to the grade school kids as a better library system. It just, it just makes sense to knowledge, like start version controlling our knowledge bases. So how do we do this? This is where the tutorial part kicks in. So if you have a machine open, and you already have, uh, if you're on Linux or a Mac, you probably already have Git there. If uh, you don't, you're on Windows, there's this beautiful thing called uh, Git Bash, which is what we'll be going through today. I am gonna focus on the command line version of everything, because that's how it was written. That's what it was intended to do. It's gonna be a bunch of commands that you telegraph to your computer, and it does a thing. Uh, but there are a ton of GUI tools out there. These are just the first four that got named when I was making the slide. There are others. And I used to be kind of against them. Like, you gotta do it the command line way. It makes more sense to do it that way. But I've been thoroughly convinced recently that's not the case. These tools exist for a reason and they've evolved right along, um, right along with Git. And you can see visually things a little bit cleaner and clean up some problems and have like logic layers of how it deals with like conflicts and whatnot. So if you want to start with a GUI, start with a GUI. If you want to start with a command line, start with a command line. But either way, you got to get Git on your machine before you can do anything else. So I'm going to walk through a bunch of commands now. And if you have these slides at home pulled up, I've hidden every other slide, but there's a animated GIF that shows like what does this actually look like running and how it might look on your machine if you wanted to copy exactly what I did. So first thing we're going to do is init. Init says, let's go ahead and create a Git repository in this folder. You can have as many Git repositories on your machine as you want, just one Git file per folder. And what a Git folder actually is, to demystify the whole thing, Git is basically just a bunch of bash commands that make folders and move files around with like this one special little part that makes these things called hashes. Well, other than that, you can completely manually recreate Git if you wanted to. You probably don't want to, but you, you absolutely could. There's nothing that's magic special here. It's a dot folder, so that means it's hidden. It's a dot Git. Uh, if you're brand new to all of this stuff, uh, ls minus a will show you all of your hidden folders when you're in a command line situation. Or and if you're on a Mac or PC, just try to find the option to show hidden folders. There's a lot of hidden folders in there. But inside of here, I'm not gonna dig into all the internals, but there's a thing called head. Head just tells you where we are. Where is this reality? Everything else is kind of storing all the changes over time and the meta around those changes. There's a proper naming system to all of this, or tree and nodes and branches. I'm not gonna get into that today. It's kind of a little confusing when you first learn it. When you dig into the internals later, it becomes important, but um, 
get init's the first thing. We have to say, hey, exist git. And it's like, all right, I'll start paying attention now. And then there's this thing called git status. Git status is the safest thing in the world to run. If you're ever confused and lost, just git status. And it says, hey, this, is, this is how I think the world looks right now. And it will say, hey, I, you haven't had any commits made to me, but there's all these files I can see, but I don't know what to do with them. They're just, they're there. What do you want me to do? Again, get stupid. It needs you to tell it. So we're going to do this little dance called git add git commit. So far, again, we're only ever working locally. So git add puts things kind of in a file folder, and git commit puts those things in a file cabinet. So if I was to, should have got a file folder. Um, if I was to say, if we could take a digital representation of everything up here, imagine this is like digital and not real. I can say, all right, this is the state of this stuff right now. I want to put this as is, this version of reality, in a file folder. And I say, okay, we're going to take a snapshot of this stuff. But it's not a snapshot. It's actually this stuff. We're gonna, that's a git add. We're going to git add everything. We're going to add dot. And then I say, all right, I want to remember this stuff. So I put a timestamp. Like at 921, I had the cup under the projector and initial commit. Great. Put that in a file cabinet. That is done. That is in there for good. We can get rid of it if we really, really want to, but that's there. And now I come along later and I move that around and move this up here and do one of those. Actually, I'll probably catch fire. So I'll do one of those. Move this a little bit and I put my phone up here. Now I can say, all right, git add or save all this and then git add. And now I've stuffed this representation of the world into a new folder. And I write on the outside of it. I move the coffee cup, uh, move the mic stand, move my phone. That's good enough for my notes for the future. Write down the outside, put that in the file cabinet. Then I do it again. Make some movements, do the thing. Ad nauseum. Keep taking those snapshots of the representational state of the world, putting them in a file folder, writing on the outside, and that's my commit, putting that in. So as you can guess, I have this file folder full of these files of these commits. So I can go back and look at them and eventually go back in time with them. But I'll get to that. So when we add a file, what we do is we're adding it to st the staging area of Git. So Git's like, all right, I know now that you want me to pay attention to this thing, and I can see what version it is right now. Put in that file folder. So you can say individual file names. More complex projects you're working on, this is actually the safest, best way to do it. But if you're really, really lazy, or you know, I'm just going to trust everything I did was correct, um, git add dot. Dot is a magical thing in bash. It's the self-referential dot. It says here. Like, git add everything in this folder and everything related to this folder underneath it. It's, it's a kind of magical special character called dot. If you ever see one on a command line, it's like cd dot dot. That just means the directory above me. So like two special magical characters in Bash, I love. Um, anyway, then when we write our commit message, we can throw a dash M flag in the command line and say, all right, here's my message. If you're using a GUI, there'll just be a box and just write your commit messages in there and it does the same thing. Um, on the command line though, if you don't type the dash M flag, then you get dropped into the default editor. And on most systems, that is set to VI or VEM. Um, if you're lucky, it'll be set to Nano or Pico, but most of the time you're going to be in VI. Uh, the number one thing Googled on Stack Overflow, Googled and found on Stack Overflow, is how to quit them. Not kidding. Because it's an archaic, weird system when you first encounter it. Like, you have to type a I to insert to type your message, escape to get back to the command or the level of it, then colon WQ to write quit. Which, on the surface, like, wow, that is convoluted as heck. But if you want to go to a world where your fingers never have to leave the keyboard, ever, learn Vim. It's actually really fun, and it will, if you can touch type, it will improve your efficiency, like, dramatically, like, almost immediately. You can make it do anything. This is a technology that's been around for 30 years that's only ever gotten better and only improved. It's convoluted to use at first, but if you want to memorize 100 hotkeys, it's better than Sublime Text or Visual Studio. I'm convinced of this because you are in the code. Uh, anyway, enough preaching about them. But once we've got the steps down of add and repeat, 
We just do this over and over and over and over again. And honestly, this is 90% of Git usage. This is 90% of how I use Git. Git add, Git commit. And another step we'll get to later. What this does is it gives us this ability to look back in time and see Git log. So we can see exactly what we have done in this repository. And that stupid long number there, that commit hash, that's the magic of Git. And I don't think we should overlook this. The likelihood that this number will ever be repeated is one in three billion. Never in the wild has there ever been two commits the same, two commit hashes the same, especially not on a single project. It was forced in a lab one time. They like they figured out a way to cause a conflict to happen there, but that was an artificial situation. Like it's kind of this magical algorithm that happens based on the contents of the thing you're doing. It's kind of cool. Um, the Git logs are a lot of information. You also do this thing called Git log one line, which just spits out a quick list. So there's a small one, but I'm going to go live code this thing, and I'm going to do a Git. I, I aliased that, so I didn't have to type it out, but it's git log one line. And here is the actual history for this project I do called kevinthal.com, a buddy of mine in the Drupal world that I run this website. And here's the actual things we have done with this site. So at a glance, I can see, like, oh, okay, we did that. Okay, oh, right, I see who did that, okay. Just a very, a very quick glance of the world. You can also see what have I changed. Like, all right, I'm working and, all right, I made a bunch of changes to this file. I've been working here for 20 minutes and I keep hitting save, but I don't, I don't remember where I started. When was the last time I committed? Uh-oh. Well, gets there again, git diff. This is the basic use of git diff. Git, git diff actually has a bunch of uses, but the basic one is, uh, where am I? What, what have I done? What has changed? And one of the cool, interesting things on git is Git doesn't do individual characters, so I kind of lied earlier when I said you change two characters. It changes lines. It understands lines of things. But if you change a character on a line, it thinks you destroyed the entire line. So that's why you have a negative red. Like, red is, this is the second line, and then down below it's the exact same thing. I just added a space of above, or a, a character turn above. And it's like, all right, there's a whole new line. You erase that line. It's keeping track of things very fine-grained. And all that stuff at the top is actually important to Git itself. And it's things if on a very, very advanced uses, you can actually use that information in very effective ways to get back in time and to modify things. But that's moving forward in time. Again, if you understand that of like, I'm taking a representational state, adding it to like Git pay attention to this, and then Git commit to like save it long term, that is 90% of Git, as far as just pure usage. But what makes Git exceptionally powerful is this ability, that we can go back in time the same way we went forward in time. Literally. There's a thing called revert, where you can just step back through all of your commits and say, unravel what you did. If you know anything about knitting or crocheting, it's literally just pulling the thread back out, and you just go back in time a step. It's very safe to do because you're just undoing the thing you last did. So there's not going to be any conflicts with that. It's pretty cool, pretty safe. You can revert to any of, the, any of these IDs. So when we're reverting, what we revert is the actual ID. And the short ID versus the long ID, Git doesn't care. It knows they're both the same thing. So this ID maps to the other longer ID, and it's all fine. So here I have said Git revert this one, and there, sure enough, what happened is I got a brand new commit that happened that reverted the last set of changes. But that last set of changes are still sitting there. So there's EDB, EDB8895, and there it is. But there's a new commit ahead of it. Because you're still going forward in time, even though c from a code functionality perspective, you've taken a step back. This gets kind of stupid. It like, doesn't want to go back in time. It's like, all right, I'm just going to keep adding things. And you can keep tracking, and you can go back to anything. You can even revert reverts, which happens sometimes. Like, well, you know what? That revert didn't actually fix the problem. I guess that bug was somewhere else. Let's just revert that revert. 
kind of looks funny in your history, but it's a safe way to do it. Because again, a revert is just a commit. But there's this other thing called git reset. And you throw the flag hard, and it's like, all right, I'm going to forget everything after you told me that point in time. So I git revert to uh, eddg. There you go. So I had these other changes ahead where I reverted my revert, but that looks stupid in my uh, in my hi git history later. So I don't really have to explain why I reverted a revert. So I'll just git reset hard and pretend those didn't ever happen. Now, word of warning about this, this is super dangerous. If you get revert hard or get reset hard to the wrong point, uh, there's ways to get out of it, but it's convoluted and you kind of hose yourself. And if you're working on a project with other people, they're going to hate you if you've done this because that's going to mess up their git logs. Uh, so revert's very safe and nobody's going to get mad at you for reverting. Get reset hard should be a discussion with your team. I'm going to do this and everybody's like, okay, we're good with that. Then you do that. If you're working by yourself, do whatever you want. That's forward and back in time. Git add, git commit, and git revert. Three commands, not that much. Git status, git log, those are informational, good to know. Not that many commands yet. But then we get to like the real superpower of git and why this will change your life as a developer. This concept of I'm gonna create an entire parallel universe based on what's here now, and anything I do in that parallel universe does not affect my master reality until I want it to. And if I don't ever want it to, it doesn't have to. You can have as many branches as you possibly want. I have one, a Drupal repo with 6,868 uh, 6, branches because I installed every module. There's a, another project. Uh, there's no limit to it. And you can play in these as much as you like. And then when you're done, you just merge those back together and say, all right, I want this reality to now become this reality's timeline. So the word master here is convenient, but it's arbitrary. Like that's just what your first like reality of Git is just happens to be called. They could have called it like reality one, it's been the same thing. In fact, you could rename it if you want. So there's no like master slave relationship here. It's just like masters default what they called the original baseline reality. So you can say Git branch and Git branch will just tell you where you are. It's like, all right, here's the branches I see. And there's a bunch of flags for this, and if you're working with online repositories, you can look at remote repository branches without having to pull them down, but we'll get to that later. But to make a new branch, you just say git branch and then name the new branch. And it's like, all right, there's a new branch now. Get set up to do this out of the box. And then once you move over to that branch, you just git checkout. And checkout's this very powerful feature. And in, who here has ever worked like in the SVN world or uh, any other centrally controlled version control system? So. Good, I'm not gonna have to unlearn y'all on this one. Uh, I learned SVN first, so it just like threw me off when I first encountered it. Git checkout says, hey Git, move the head of what we're working on over here, and let's pay attention, or not pay attention, let's pretend like this is all of reality now, in this branch. This doesn't just affect what it's trying to track, this affects everything, so when you check out, all of your text docs will magically transform into whatever's in that branch. So if my branch, like I've deleted a plugin, and I'm working there, and I go back to master branch, and that plugin's still there, just it, it's almost automagical that all of that just transforms for you. You don't have to like save anything or do anything special. You're just like checking out this new reality. You can do this all day. So if you want to test out a plugin, make a new branch, throw that plugin just in that branch, test the heck out of it. If that doesn't work. Let's flush it. We don't need to care about this. If it works, let's merge it back in. All right. Um, yep, the branch, you're bran ah, the branch you're working in, you do the exact same steps. You git add, git commit, and it has its own git log. And eventually you merge that back in. So that's a point there. In the merge, you just say, hey, merge this but where you're merging from. First, you gotta make sure you're in the branch where you wanna merge into, because again, everything with Git is local. From Git's point of view, it doesn't, it doesn't wanna pu push things, uh, it doesn't wanna, uh, it doesn't wanna move things around 
outside of it. It wants to th things move into it or move like push away from itself. So go back to like check out master and then merge branch that you want to merge into master from there, and it works good. Yes, that's it. So if you want to merge things back into master, you check out into master. But merge works both ways. So if I have, this is a classic with, um, with updates. So uh, WordPress.org has released a, a core update. Meanwhile, I'm working on a new theme that I'm like custom theming over in a branch. I apply the main, uh, apply the update to my master branch, get that to production. Then I go back jump back into my branch that I'm working in for my new, my new theme, let's call it new theme branch, and I get merge master for my new theme branch, and it pulls that change over so I can make sure that those updates aren't gonna break my theme work. Very powerful. You can do this in less than 10 seconds. Like, this is a very fast operation for Git. It's like, okay, now I'm good. I can do this. Really quick, really lightweight. So you have infinite number of test machines on your machine now. Congratulations. <laughs> with almost zero setup. If you're working locally, this just works. Um, but you will run into the sad trombones of the Git world eventually, and there's no way to, I can tell you to prevent it, where you'll hit a merge conflict. And a merge conflict is where the same document or documents have changed in both places. You changed it in master and you changed it in this branch and again, Git is the stupid content tracker. It doesn't know what you meant. It's like, one of these is probably right, but I'm just gonna fail now. But it's not gonna completely fail. Git merge will actually get to a state where it's like, I'm gonna keep trying to merge this thing, and now I'm in this funky state you need to fix. And all you really need to do to fix it is go and find all of those, merge, or those conflicts, and it will do this to your text. Because again, we're just talking about text files. Uh, so here's like, okay, this is what you said in master, and here's what you said in new branch. What is it? And then once we fix it, to be our liking, what do we do? We save. What? No. We, like, we're, we're back and like, we're trying to fix this in master, and there's a merge conflict that's happened. We fix the text document. Like, all right, this all looks right to me now, git. We save, git add, git commit. And we go back, we just right back to that forward march. When in doubt, you're probably gonna do a git status and then probably git add and git commit. Like that solves a whole world of problems for you. There's also a bunch of tools that do, uh, will help you out with this stuff. But here's like a quick example. Like here's me literally editing that text file. I was like, all right, here's, here's what I really want it to be. Now git add, git commit, fix my merge conflicts and there, I'm good to go. Get status is clean. We're all happy. Again, you watch that on your screen, it'll look a little better. Uh, but there are tons of tools that will help with this. In fact, this is one of the arguments for using a GUI. Uh, GUIs have this, can have built-in logic layers that can assist with this out of the box. Uh, source tree is my favorite. It's like I will crack open source tree if I hit a merge conflict that I can't figure out. Because it will like show me visually things that I can't conceptualize in my head that easily, uh, and will actually help me find all of the merge conflicts. But there's all sorts of tools. If you just type git merge tool, it will say, if you don't have any of these installed by default, which one would you like to use? And then once you pick one, it will like throw you into that tool, which is, will just take you right to the conflicts and let you fix it in text. Everything up to this point has all been on your machine, 100% local. Now we're gonna talk about git repos, or Git repositories on machines you don't own. But guess what, it's just Git. There's a fancy UI on top of it, don't get me wrong, like all of these people have done amazing things. GitHub is the classic, the first to bat, uh, but GitLab, their CI CD is pretty darn awesome. There's a reason the Drupal projects went with them as their uh, collaboration hub. Bitbucket's got uh, some advantages as well. I'm not gonna say one over the other, they all, but they're all implementations of Git online. I'm gonna show GitHub because it's the most common, and I think everyone needs a GitHub account. But this is just the same as doing a Git log locally. Just, it looks a little different. The model is very, 
very simple once you start viewing it only from everything's local and I'm basing my point of view inside of one of these bubbles because you're pushing away from yourself and you're pulling into yourself. So if we look at um, your repository, you get pushed to a remote, but from the remote's perspective, it's pulling the code into it. From my repository origin, I am pushing. And then on my colleagues machine, they're gonna pull that content from, or pull that code or whatever, those files from origin into their machine. You pull into the repo, you push away from the repo. And if you always view it from the point of view of you know, one of these points of view, it makes a lot more sense. It's like, all right, I am on GitHub, I need to pull something into here. I'm on my local machine, I want to push it to another machine. But yeah. Ah, ah, good, good question. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, so when you create a GitHub repository, which is like well, the next thing I'm getting to, but great question. Um, just the same as your master reality just happens to be called master, your first remote repository, your first remote, like the, yeah, let me get to the next slide and then <laughs> I'll fix this. Your first remote, is just happens to be called origin. So when you make uh, a remote repository um, on GitHub, it will give you like all these options of things to do. So you're creating a new repository and you're either gonna build from there on GitHub or you're gonna do this probably, push an existing repository from your local machine. Would say, all right, I'm gonna add a remote. Git remote is like, here's a machine that's not this machine where there's a clone of this repository that I need you to be connected with and tell me if you're in sync. Because Git might be stupid, but it can tell you if it's identical to its twin. And if it's not identical, it's like, I'm not identical anymore. And it can tell you like, hey, we're out of sync. Um, this many, I see this many commits ahead that I don't have locally. What, what should we do? Or not, I won't even ask you, we'll just sit there. But um, saying, all right, Git remote. And the first remote just happens to be called origin. There's no rule to that. You can call your remotes whatever you want to call them. Uh, but the first one just happens to be called origin. So in this model, yeah, that's, that just happens to be the first GitHub repository we made for this. So it's in the first place we want to push. Yep, literally. That's um, LAN. If I have the address of this machine on a network, Git don't care. There's like no, computer A, computer B, however we network them together, Git don't care. It just knows, I got a remote here and I have an address that realizes it's over here. I can conceptually connect these two things now. It depends on the project. Remember, this was invented. GitHub was like long in the future. Like this was invented on local machines that are on LAN networks. So, or around the world. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is Git is so lightweight. It would work on an old BVS. Like we're just moving deltas around. Um. Yeah, and then there's these concepts of git push. Uh, so you can push to the origin. Uh, and we push, we have to pick what branch we're pushing. Because we can push any of our branches anywhere. So you can store all of your branches online. Or work with them that way. And then pass like, hey, I'm doing this experimental branch. Why don't you pull down that branch from GitHub? That's actually a pretty common phrase in, when you're working. Um, I'm testing out a couple things internally to Pantheon and Terminus. And that's how we're doing it. It's like, okay, go grab this branch and go test that out. This is how it works. Uh, you can have as many remotes as you want. So you have a thousand remotes if you want. I don't know the use case for that. Uh, a lot of people dual remote. Like I have things where they will push things to Pantheon and they'll also store it in GitHub for long-term storage. Good question? Yeah. No, it adds the branch locally. And then you can check out that branch. You're getting a clone of that branch. Yeah. It's the same repository, 
It's just a branch on that repository. When you clone down, you automatically clone down master. I haven't even got to clone yet. Um, yeah, I'll just jump to clone now, just for the sake of time, too. Uh, so clone, most people don't just add remote repositories, and that's not how they work with remotes. Most people will work with remote by default because that came with where they got the code from. There's a the concept of git clone that does all a bunch of stuff for you. Yeah, um, a bunch of stuff for you. So you can uh, say, all right, initialize this here, copy everything down, and set the remote to be where you got it from. By default, you just get master with that. But you can say, hey, git, go pull this branch as well. And then it's just like you made that branch locally. Git doesn't know the difference. And then it's just git checkout, and you're in that branch the same way it'd be if you created it locally. All right, jump back here real quick. So I can git push locally. So I'll change, make some changes, push them up to GitHub. I can also edit on GitHub, or someone else could have edited this file, pushed it back to GitHub, and then I would need to, oh, went the wrong direction. Then I would need to pull that information back down. It's technically a fetch, a fetch and update, but I'm not getting into semantics with you here. If you say git pull, it will say, hey, go make this true versus what I see over there. Again, you could get a merge conflict from this. It could be like, hey, something's wrong here, depending on how you've been working with that repository. But with enough git statuses and enough quick code reviews, it should be good to go. And then same thing. We just push, push pull all day long. Git clone, though, I already talked about. This is the most common way people use GitHub. It's like, I'm going to git clone this down. At some, at some point, you will run into a situation in your life like, oh, there's code for that on GitHub. Just go pull it down. Eventually, someone will say something like that to you. This is what they mean. Go run the git clone command, throw it into your local, and then get to work. You can optionally name the thing. So git clone, the address of that GitHub repository, and then WPCLI demo is just what I called that folder. So we'll clone it into that folder. I can change into that folder and see what's going on. There's that demo folder I just made. And that gets us up to the last important section, which is pull requests. Pull requests are concepts you actually already know. We already covered these. It's a branch and a merge, but there's a conversation in the middle of, hey, why do you want to do this? That's all it is. Branching and merging. Again, we're just using Git on a machine you don't own. Unless you do own it. You can run your own Git instance out there in the cloud. It's cool. Uh, but you have to be the person who runs it. GitHub gives us this ability of a repository owner. First, you can actually say, this goes in here. You can have multiple owners, but that's why it's very, very important to have people that are like core committers who can actually make changes officially to a thing. Everybody can make suggestions. We can all go right now on our computers and make a suggestion to WordPress core. Say, here's what we think we should have. Here's a patch that we think should be applied to WordPress core. But there's only a handful of people in the world that can say, yeah, that's a good idea. So that's the person over here, the person in green. Like, they're the repository owner. Everybody can push up to um, a branch to the repository. I'm going to, there's more complicated than that just pushing, but you can open a pull request with a new branch and say, hey, check out this branch. Check out this code in this branch. And if it's cool, then you merge it with master on your end. That's called a pull request. GitHub has a very, very, very slick interface for this. So does GitLab, so does Bitbucket. Uh, make it very, very easy. You can do this all with command line as well, but I'm not going to bother getting into that world. Way easier with the GUIs on this one. And that's it. If you, is it 16 or 12? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 16, uh, 15 commands. If you ever know, can remember like this list of commands, this is honestly 95% of what I've ever seen Git used for. There are a bunch of other crazy awesome tools with it called like Git Bisect, where it will help you track down where a bug emerged. Um, Git Cherry Pick, where you can like really mess up your repository and then say, nah, I'm just gonna cherry pick off of these other areas, like what's reality? And then we're gonna say, all right, Git, this is reality now, go forward. Um, but those only get into situations where you've done something more advanced. The vast majority of time, all you're probably going to do is git clone, git add, git commit, and git push origin master. Those four commands 
are literally 99.9% .9 of what I personally ever do with Git. For everything else in the world, just go to DuckDuckGo. Uh, I'm, I'm not even saying it for the privacy concern reasons, but if you, if you look up anything Git related on Google, you're gonna get Stack Overflow from 2012 from the way the indexing works. Just the truth. Not that there's anything wrong with that, Git hasn't changed. Same Git. Uh, I find DuckDuckGo actually gets me to the documentation and actually relevant current information just faster. I don't know why, but it does. Thousands and thousands of resources out in the world for you. Uh, how to get started guides, um, full on tutorials where you can learn the command line of Git from the browser and things like that. But that's it, that's what I got. Thank you, I'm Dwayne, and we got a question. The short answer is what makes sense for you. Both are completely valid options. Um, the, some people would argue that just doing the, uh, the custom work you're doing is the best thing to only version control that because why would you version control core? Um, I'm showing you literally, this is my blog. This is my website, mcdwayne.com, where you can get the, uh, the slides for this. Uh, this is the entire WordPress install because I'm on Pantheon and we version control your code automatically, and as an artifact of that, we do version control all of WordPress. So there's no harm in this. There's no, I think, great benefit to it either. What you probably actually wanna do is go to a world of uh, Composer, where you tell Composer, go grab all the off-the-shelf parts like WordPress core, and I'll only worry about these two folders that live over here, and I can even tell Composer to go grab those folders when you're compiling the thing. But that's a completely separate subject. Um, but like what, but this is my version control here. It's like a uh, git log. This is how I have, <laughs> yeah, handwriting plugins is still hard. Um, uh, this is what I've actually done to my site. I can see when I, uh, things are updated and yeah, this is git log one line, but I could go just a uh, quick git, git log. And here's everything I've ever done, like here's, I patched the mark, uh, mark downify um, to con continue to. Um, yeah, but this is like literally a real world use case. This is how I manage my blog. I just change it in Git and push it up when I'm done. That's All right, a question? No, it's a repo. A Git repos or Git repo, Git repo, it doesn't matter. There is a way to commit to command line create GitHub repos, but I don't know what it is. But it's in the docs. Like it, you can do it. Uh, it's in the GitHub docs specifically. Yeah, you, you need the GitHub CLI to uh, pull that off. But the e the far easier path that works reliably is just go create it on GitHub first. Yeah, that's it. That just follow the directions there. It's like two steps, and it's just it's way reliable. But there is a command line way. I just don't know what it is. No, that's, uh, oh, that's a great, great question. Committing WP uh, config. So I do, um, so I, I'm happy to show anybody my WP config actually, let's cat it, uh, WP config, because, oh, config.php, because I'm on Pantheon and like all of our server variables are hidden. So like, so yeah, this is, yeah, DB name, username, they're all picked up from the server. So if you're doing it this way and you're using a token system, 
yeah, commit it all day, because who cares? Uh, unless you don't want people to see your redirects, which they're going to hit anyway. Um, oh, clear. Sorry. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, William. So, oh, sorry. So, for people that didn't hear the question, should you commit, if you're going to commit everything, what about WP config? And in general, no, don't commit WP config if you're going to version control everything, unless you're using a tokenized system like we have at Pantheon, where it doesn't matter. It's just like a something, a server variable that's going to get picked up, and then, then it doesn't really matter. What I didn't talk about, because I think it's, it's something you don't really need when you first, first, first encounter Git, and that's who this is designed for is the, um, the git ignore file. So if I do a la, I have a git ignore file, and a git ignore file simply says, uh, I'll spot it, spot git. Ignore all of this stuff. Git, don't pay attention. If it's a dot dmg, a dot jar, a dot zip, do not track it. Uh, if it's an icon, which is a thing, our DS store, screw me, DS store. Um, I hate DS store so much. Like, just completely ignore it. Like, we are not going to track that. Don't even ask me. I don't want you to know. So that's git ignore. It will just let you ignore things. This becomes very important if you're doing, like, complex projects with nested git roots. Our ne nested git um, repos, you can say, all right, let's just ignore all of those and just deal with the high, high, highest level. But like William said here, the other better approach is anything that you uh, don't want to version control. You can move up a level. And WordPress and most hosts will let you do a thing called nested dock root, where you're actually putting the actual install a level below in something called web or dock root, or depends on what server environment you're in. Most of will let you call it whatever you want. On Pantheon, it's just called web. But you can store things in there. And then above that is all the meta about your site. And you can store anything in there you want. And those would be separate repos, or the same repo, or multiple ways to approach that, but that's a good way to do it. It's like keep that stuff above that you're not version controlling. No, um, submodules are not a great idea in my general opinion. Some people will argue that, um, and there's that's one of the beautiful parts about computer science is there's not a 100% right answer to that. I would discourage that, and I would say individual repos for every app that you're running. Uh, it's just going to be cleaner and a much smaller repo. It, uh, I, when I say Git is lightweight, it is, but if the repo is like six, um, 68 meg, it's still 68 meg. Yeah, exactly. But there's no like one 100% right I could tell you. William might have an idea though. <laughs> there you go. Agree with William. William said don't use submodules. Uh, Git stash has gotten me into trouble more than it saved me. I'll be honest with you. So Git has this ability called Git stash, which just says anything we got committed, or not committed, anything we got staged, uh, or any changes we can see, let's just ignore them for now, and let's me do like get out of like any s weird state I'm in temporarily. So, the the big best use case I've ever seen for Git stash is, uh oh, update rolled out, and this is a mission critical like security flaw update. We got to get to production. Everybody, get stash right now. Make sure your stuff's clean. We're gonna push this to production. All right, now we can unstash and go right back to where you left off, and hope nothing broke. I have forgotten to unstash personally enough times that it's burned me that I like other alternative routes to stashing, but stashing is a powerful tool. If you're working locally, it's actually super handy. But don't forget to unstash or you'll end up with more problems than you started with. Yeah, that's it. Like it, you're you're telling Git, you're you're literally telling Git, "Hey, stop working for a second. So we can just get around this, this one issue. So Git stash is powerful, but use it at your discretion. Yeah. 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 
ab- absolutely. That, that is a proper way to use it, and I'm not going to argue against that. It's just I've burned myself enough trying that that I don't do this, <laughs> but that's personal. Everybody's going to have a different opinion. I think that's it. I, th- I, think, I think we have time for maybe one more, but no? All right, one more, and then we'll, then we'll clap. <laughs> Git is just a hidden folder, so there is no danger in doing it that way. But why you wouldn't just use like GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket is like that. That would be more of the question. I mean, if you're yeah, if you're just like locally getting into that machine and getting to the actual file, like I don't. I don't see a problem with that. Like I don't. I've never seen that actually in practice. But like, it was the end. Last one. You got GitLab? Cool. GitLab's awesome because it's the CI/CD runner system. But that's a whole other just conversation. All right, that is it, folks. Thanks very much for coming. Again, I was Dwayne. You can get the slides over at mcduane.com and uh, have a rest of WordCamp. <laughs>